Lagos Business School, Pan Atlantic University. I'm Bumi Akolati, Alumni Relations Director for the school. Um, but not everybody, but hopefully you have all been seeing our name through the various emails that we sent. Again, apologies for starting late, but we will definitely still finish at 11. So I'll um, let the party go now. Thank you. Well. So we're going to talk about how businesses can be scaled using technology. Scalability is something that comes in with a lot of experience. A lot of people say I've worked for 30 years, 40 years, and now have the experience to scale my business. And suddenly we talk about businesses who are two years old, three years old, and they are talking about way more valuation, way more turnover than those businesses for the last two, three decades have been doing. What's this? Why is this? What's right and what's wrong? So I would like to put in some of the inputs from our team that we put together. Most of the things I'm sure you know already, but we will try and run through it in an organized format. And I'll be happy to take your questions after this. Nothing is new here in this presentation. Most of the things you would have come across. Let's go ahead. I would start by talking about Moore's Law. Moore's Law spoke about how technology is going to make a differentiation in each one's life. How small things, home computers, digital wristwatches, automatic cars, and various other portable devices. Each, you know, most of the guys when they were entering, they had their iPads with them, they had their tablets with them, their phones, phones, I you know, emphasize, not phone, are very important to them. They're digital cars, people have technology in their cars. Everywhere, people are trying to go closer to technology to make things simplified. Moore's Law says, you know, he said it that in every two years, the complexity or the strength of technology, number of transistors on each chip will double. What that means is your Nokia, your Motorola phones became your Nokia phones, became your Samsung and Apple phones. Same device, lesser in size, with way more capabilities. And that's still going on. People are still talking about, let's disrupt this and let's disrupt that. How, how has entrepreneurship changed over this period? Entrepreneurs have always had the zeal, whether it is today or 50 five decades back, always had the zeal and enthusiasm to prove themselves, to make the impact on the world. But use of technology has taken the handicap away from various people. The handicap of location, the handicap of capital, the handicap of various things. So let's, let's just try and compare how it was and how it is. You needed days, even months, to start a business. Is that the same scenario today? It has changed you know, drastically there. Domain knowledge was something that was passed within the family. I am a tailor, proudly, and my son is going to be the best tailor. Because what happened was, the father used to teach the son, and so on. But people didn't transfer domain knowledge. And tailor is, I mean, tailoring is just an example. But I'm saying, that's how businesses were. That's how associations were managed. But today, domain knowledge is your children can know more about a particular domain if they are focused. And if they you know, focus, they look at the content available on the net and try to gain the knowledge. They might not get exactly the practical experience that you have got or your elders have, but they will get exposure to great amount of content which can enable them to achieve much more. Businesses were expensive to start. Major reason being that making a mistake, I mean, every startup, every new business idea knows there is a percentage of success and a percentage of failure. But today what has happened is your initial capital requirements have gone down drastically. So if you wanted to have a retail business of books yesterday, or if you wanted to have a retail business of cakes and bakery yesterday, first thing you would do is, which is the right location? Ikoi, VI, Ikeja, Surulere, 
and you look for a place which already has footfall. And you know what you'll find out? The landlord is a pompous guy who says, three years rent in advance, some couple of million down your, from your pocket, and you've already invested. And that money, where is it coming from? It's coming from partially from you, partially from the banks, and you're paying 15 to 22% rate of interest on that. How is that easy? That means on day one of your business, you've already got a negative of 15% on the capital that you've picked up. Just because you needed a place to try. And you don't even know whether the type of cakes, type of product that you're offering has the right product and customer match. Because you never had the chance to experiment. To experiment, you needed a store. But things have changed. Today, when the newer generation is trying options, what they do is they do something called as beta testing. They do something called as pilot. And they are very aggressive about it. Oh, my product has found the right customer match. And they do it through online, through various channels, through research, through A-B testing. They try and reach their market audience before they invest any significant amount into the business. And I would suggest that you know each one of us, whether traditional, whether digital, any form of business we are in, we should try and take this practice because this gives us the flexibility to maneuver, flexibility to change, flexibility to adapt to the requirements of the customers. Do we all agree? Yes. Expensive to run the business then and less expensive to run the business now. I think I've covered that. Uh, majorly about the fixed investments, warehouse cost, rental cost, but along with that, you didn't, you couldn't get the maximum amount of productivity. 15 years back, less number of companies were using ERP solutions, CRM softwares, manpower solutions, but almost all companies today, medium scale and above, have the right technology to manage their efficiency. Performance management systems, to track who is doing what, how are they doing, what should be the growth like. It sounds like uh, too many systems required to achieve a particular outcome. Too many softwares. And then instead of taking the warehouse, we might end up investing the same amount of money in softwares. But with the help of cloud technology, these softwares have become very, very economical. Most of these softwares I'm talking about can range between 20 to $50 a month. And you can use it for five months, six months. You don't have to buy for two years and five years and so on. I mentioned about how flexible the businesses were. Imagine I had put a plastic factory. And then I found out, no, this plastic factory is no more in fashion. I need to change and I need to adapt and put something else, maybe, uh, maybe a paper bag factory. What has happened is, the, yes, the place can still be used, but the machines that I had bought have already gone down the drain. Or I have to resell it, find a buyer, I don't know what price he'll agree. But in most of the new trends, if you check what the market requires, if you check what the total demand is, you have the accessibility to adapt. It was hard for entrepreneurs to scale businesses. What scalability meant there was, if you wanted to expand the cake shop we spoke about, you had to get various other stores for expansion. You had to invest in stock. Let's take an example of a furniture store. Furniture store, I have one in Ikoi. I want to expand, I want to get one in Ikeja. I want to expand, I want to get one in Abuja, and then one in Rivers, Potakot, right? But what all these four stores means is incremental rental, incremental stock, increased people, and so on. And obviously the warehousing. I can't keep all my stock in the showroom. This is not a very scalable model. What's a more scalable model? How many of us have heard of IKEA? Anyone? What IKEA did was, smart guys, studied the market. They said, when you buy a furniture, what is it that you're paying for? If it is a 100 Naira furniture, 30 Naira is the cost of the furniture. 70 Naira is cost of maintaining the showroom. Does it really matter where you bought the furniture from? Whether the AC in that showroom was chilling well or not? Whether the lady in the showroom was dressed well or not? 
at the end of the day it is the same furniture which is going to come to your house and last for whatever duration you want it to last they said if we disrupt this solution the way to go is take the 70% cost of it interesting how will you do it anyone who knows how we can do it or how they did it they said no we will not have a showroom in ikoi or in ikeja we will have a showroom in ikorodu people laughed at them and said are you crazy great furniture who will go to ikorodu to pick up furniture why what's the problem why wouldn't people go to ikorodu it's a good drive people will go to ikorodu they said no bringing the furniture back bringing a dining table in a bus in a truck back to ikoi or ikeja you will still charge me the same amount of money in transportation <coughs> to this they said we will break this all the furniture which ikea sells today is modular furniture it's do it yourself furniture and what they have done is it is the fastest growing furniture company in the world what they have done is they have started offering much more affordable furniture to people in a comp in a in a category like furniture there is no technology it's not a microsoft or a google most of the examples that i'll talk about today will not be from technology companies will be from companies that work in brick and mortar brick and mortar industries access to market wasn't as easy expansion for a retail business was wait for the customers to knock on your door i don't have footfall market is not moving people are not coming economy is bad if people are not coming why can't you go to the people how can i carry my store and go to the people you can't carry your store but you can take your portfolio into everyone's house i think everyone knows about e-commerce and i don't have to talk about it that has changed the perception people make their decisions and then purchase access to talent was limited by geography so if you wanted somebody to teach you how modular furniture could be made you would look at the talent that was available within lagos not even from abuja because transporting talent from abuja to lagos would be additional cost but with the help of technology today what has happened is the complete pool of talent worldwide is available to you skype calls i think this is part of everyone's lingo today the only thing is we are we are not aggressive enough we don't take enough initiative to go to somebody on a linkedin or in a conference that can you teach me this can you talk to me about this i would like to learn more on this what's the harm trust me for all those who have young kids there will be various points in time going ahead when you will have to tell your kid can you teach me this and there is no ego there there is no ego there a bigger business should learn from smaller businesses and that's the way evolution is taking place do we all agree with that yes. there's no ego there right that yes great so easy in reaching businesses they want and more choices than ever with technology we have made this a possibility let's move ahead on that so let's do a reality check we all know this i like i mentioned it's all known that technology can be used majority of the times when i speak to people they say you don't know the pankar we are in africa and we use this term so loosely as if africa has no technology africa doesn't have access to internet i mean you'll be surprised 90 million people access internet in our country but we have transformed we have changed our lifestyles don't you think your business needs to change according to that Here is an example of a small company. Small company by two ladies which was started. Everyone spoke about doing business in Nigeria. I mean, you all know about the rankings, right? Global rankings of ease ease of doing business in Nigeria. We rank I think in one of the last countries in the world. Why? Registration of company is difficult. Accounting is difficult. Uh access to power is difficult. But no one takes a step and says this is what I'm going to do about it. these fine ladies said okay we will try and help people out they have set up a process wherein you want to get your legal stuff or your company registration done you talk about these format with them and they will 
on their website, they will help you register your organization in a much faster manner. So it is a business, brick and mortar business which was there. Consultancy, we normally call these consultants, can you help me register the company? But they made it digital. It's not innovation, but it is just a slight use of technology. It's not you know, discovering the new or making the new iPod. It's just a slight change in which, which changes the way your business interacts with its customers. How easy entrepreneurship has really become. Let's take example of these two guys. You, you will tell me who these two broke guys are who I'm talking about. These two broke guys sat in Silicon Valley and spoke about, sorry? The Google boys. Ah, uh, yeah, we can talk about them, but I decided we will not talk about technology companies. What, what that means is, so obviously, when I talk about them, you'll say, the Pankar, that is a technology company. Yes, they have used technology, but I'm picking up examples from brick and mortar businesses. Industries which are evidently known as brick and mortar. Google as an industry is a technology company by, by its origin, by its DNA. But here is another company, two broke guys, sat in Silicon Valley, said they don't have an option, they don't have, they're working on their ideas, but nothing is working out. They said, okay, to earn money, time being, let's just set up three beds in our third room, in the extra room, and hire, uh, and put it up on the website, ask people to come and visit us. In the second week, they got three people visiting them. Each one paid $80 to them. Second week, $80 for a day. He said, this is great. Let's go in the same area. They went, walked, knocked doors. These are all very well qualified guys, okay? None of them are people, none of them, but very well qualified without egos. Walked, knocked doors, asked people, do you have an extra room? Would you try, would you want to let it out? People said yes, people said no. Especially the old couple said, yeah, what did I get? They said, we'll give you $50 a day. He said, wow, okay, let's try it. And today, this industry has become Airbnb. This company, I think, started in 2007. Started in 2007. That's, uh, that's around nine years. And it's a $25 billion industry. OK, somebody will tell me, the Pankar, these valuations are blown up. It's an industry that houses 700,000 people every day. It's a hotel that houses 700,000 people every day. Is that big? Yeah. There is no hotel in the world which even competes with them today. There is no Hilton, there is no, there's no hotel which comes close. And they, what they have done is they had created, they have created a model which, which was there. There was excess inventory. People who had excess extra space gave them an avenue to earn and made a business model out of it. Airbnb. Try it. I mean, for all of you who have tried it, great. For those who haven't tried it, give it a shot. Just try and experience it. Two stranded guys, very similar model, and maybe you know this is a model which most of us have used. Maybe some of us used their service while coming to while coming to uh, uh, the, the venue today. Two guys, all those who have been to New York, getting a taxi in New York is a pain, especially on a Friday night. You can stand outside your office for 20 to 30 minutes without anyone stopping for you, and what? The taxi fares are killer. They have, they call, they call something called a surcharge during high peak hours. If you take a taxi, you will pay surcharge. But even after doing all that, you will not get a taxi. They said there has to be a way. There are people who have parked cars and don't have customers. And there are people who are standing and don't have a taxi. The taxi business, the previous example I gave was the hotel industry business. They just found out the pain point that availability of rooms is not enough and it's very expensive. So in California, if you want to take a room, it's $250 plus, even if it's the smallest room. H how about $250 gets reduced to $100? Everyone is happy. Similarly here, how about the person who doesn't have a customer gets a customer, gets a willing customer, and gets it fast enough? 
That's Uber for you. So I'll move ahead because I know you know these models, but I have some more examples that I want to talk about, and I want you to give me ways how you can talk about technology in your business. These companies prove a point. You know how, how many countries Uber is in today? So I, I just told you about the valuation of Uber. Uh, I don't remember the exact number of rides Uber provides on a daily basis, but it's in millions. So what I'm trying to work towards is, if me and you started a taxi company here, we bought two taxis, then third one, then fifth one, then tenth one, wow. We would have made money. But just imagine owning 10 taxis, running that service, and utilizing, 10 ta utilizing technology to own over a million taxis in various parts of the world, making it convenient for people. So it's not that a technology guy can do this. Actually, the real person who can do it is you and me. I am from the FMCG industry, worked with small and medium scale businesses. And the worst part was, if you want to find a business, you can't. But I'll come to that, you know. I'm too excited to talk about WeConnect. That's why I'll come to that. Let's go ahead. Technology is not for brick and mortar. How many of you think that there is no way technology can be used in my business? Anyone who thinks that technology cannot disrupt anything. If you think in that manner, do me a favor. Just take a piece of pen, uh, I mean, take piece of paper and a pen, write down, think through in the start, from the start of the experience of a customer till the end, what are the major pain points? Where is it that you would like to improve the experience that you offer to your end customer? Where is it that the customer would want to get a better experience? If you think about it right, you can disrupt any industry. And you better do it yourself. You better do it yourself even though you have a business going on now, which is your bread and butter. Because if you don't do it, this man here will come and do it. This man here will come and do it. They will not wait for you that you are the leaders in this industry and will not or will always be the leaders. No. How many of you have heard of the Kodak story? Yeah. Kodak. You want to talk about it, sir? Uh, yeah. So Kodak was the first company, right? Yeah. The 25 years, maybe that was one of the reasons. But when they went to the management, right, Kodak made more money by selling the rolls rather than selling the cameras. They said if we make it digital, 80% of our business will go down. So the CEO said, are you crazy? Are you crazy? You want to kill the most profitable business of this company by going digital? They looked at him and said, sorry, sir. And the project was closed down. And multiple other companies said, sorry for Kodak. You know, right? Kodak is a non-existent company now. I mean, it's there, but it's as good as not there. And it was the leader in the photography space. The reason because they were scared of disrupting their own industry. They were the ones who discovered the digital sensors. Their technology is used in all the digital cameras, but they don't own it. Let's go ahead and see some of the... So a myth that is there is, you know, some of the myths people talk about. This is a study done by Google. And people say, you know, my business is not an e-commerce business. You need to get out of your mind. And let me know, you know, I'll share my email address. I'll be very happy to know, get your feedback if this really helps. If you remove this myth from your mind, does it help in your thinking process? Search results only send consumers to e-commerce sites. So people tell me, uh, my site is not search engine optimized because only the person who wants to come online, sorry, who wants to buy online is the person who searches online. It's a big myth. Even in United States of America, the so-called advanced country in the world, right? Only seven to eight percent of the purchases are made online. But three out of four purchase decisions are done online even if they want to buy from the Macy's or from the any other store, any other popular store, 
they actually go through the designs. And I'm talking about everything. Everything from the snack that you buy for your house, the chips that you want to pick, to the belt you want to buy, to the fashion accessory that you want to pick, or the jewelry you want to pick. Everything, the decision-making process has gone online. And you all need to be concerned about it. Because what you're losing out on is when the person is making a decision to purchase, he's not considering you if you're not online. And imagine what? Less than 3% of the businesses in Africa are online. Then we are saying, why are we not developing as fast as some of the other countries? Less than 3%. One of the businesses next door to you might be providing the service you want. But we go, can Amazon US deliver this? Why? He has it next to you. So that's a myth that we need to get out. We have to try and see how you can build a brand. And I'll talk about the three points on how each one. Building a brand is, is not spending millions of dollars. Building a brand is three basic steps, which I'll cover in the subsequent slides. Once in store, start looking at their smartphones. The retailer loses their attention. So, you know, uh, I've noticed this. Some of the people say, we don't want to provide Wi-Fi. Because if the person comes, he will start comparing the price with somebody else. But do you think you can stop the person compare price? It's not, it's not possible. Guys, get it out of your mind. People say, if I take my, if I take my products, you know, my products are handpicked from China. If I take them online, competition will copy it. Guys, those times have gone. Those times have gone and will never come back again. Your USP has to be yours. Your USP cannot be a Chinese man's USP who manufactured the product and gave it to you. Your USP has to be yours. Please, please hold that very close to you. There is no way just the assortment will become my USP and that's why I don't want to go online. Fair. Online research has lowered consumer expectation of stores. They really just go to a store to transact. So, interesting myth, right? They go to a store to transact. Online research has lowered consumers' expectation of the stores. How many of you agree with this? They're actually looking for, when they go to an online store, like I mentioned, looking for an avenue to make an informed decision. People say today's generation has less time. Actually, the thing is, today's generation is becoming more and more lazy. Seriously, they want to do everything at the click of a moment, at the click of a button, in their palm, without stepping out. You ask your son or daughter to make a decision to do the interiors of their room, right? They'll say, yeah, 20 minutes. How? Go online, check which is the color, which wallpaper is available, which bed suits them, what bed sheets are good, what, what do you do? 20 minutes, I've chosen this, it's in my cart. Can you please have a look at it? What? You didn't even step out of the house. But the truth is, people are making their decisions online. Let's move ahead. So, for all those, right? Uh, so somebody, the lady at, at the right extreme corner mentioned that she's from the cake industry. I, I really like that cake industry, you know, because uh, I'm a sweet lover. So I'll take example from your industry. And uh, other gentlemen also, some of the other people also mentioned that they are from brick and mortar industry. Very, very traditional. Here, uh, the lady there also mentioned that she has unique products for the Muslim population, targeted towards the Muslims. Right, ma'am? Yes. So, I, I just want to take these examples and give you another example of a company called Blockbuster. 20 years back. 20? No, sorry. Almost 10 to 12 years back. Sorry? 16 years back. Thank you. 16 years back, Blockbuster was a $5 billion company. And what did they do? Movie rental. Movie rental. And we all had it, right? I mean, here we get pirated CDs, but at that time when we had, we get it very conveniently, right? But at that time, we had those, those uh, v, the, uh, TV, the VCR, VCRs and the uh, cassettes. 
See, it's difficult to even get the word now. <laughs> I mean, so, yeah, I mean, that's how it is. I don't know how long I haven't seen a cassette. But people used to go out. Their fun time was, I will go to Blockbuster, rent a movie, come back, and provide it to my family. I mean, we'll all sit together and watch it. And it was, it was a luxury. People used to do it. Slowly and steadily, Blockbuster became so popular that it had the maximum number of retail branches in America. It expanded and expanded. Brick and mortar business, right? Not a technology business. They made a small software. They said, internet penetration is growing. I'll use this software. Internet penetration is growing. How about we help somebody to, they went to Blockbuster guys, met the MD. How about we become your online partners? We help the users to search for their movies. How it will be better? So those who want to come to your stores can still come to your stores, but those for some reason, maybe an old lady in the house doesn't have a transport, can still you know, get a movie. And then you deliver it to them. They were thinking small. They went to these guys, and you know what happened in the boardroom? So they were wearing jeans, t-shirt, they presented, and these guys with blazers mocked them. They said, are you guys crazy? Who, who rents movies online? Who rents movies online? It's not, it's not computer software that we will go online. They laughed at them and the CEO said, okay, we have been, this is the biggest industry in movie rental. They have shut us down. Some of them said there's no, you know, there's no scope for our business and some of them said, no man, that means there is a huge scope. They went ahead and today Netflix valuation is $15 billion. And my brothers on the left have declared bankruptcy. Because what did they do? These guys laughed at them. You know what? Late fees is the most lucrative part of the business. How many of us have used Blockbuster? None of us. But any rental service? Any movie rental service, right? So they have something called as late fees. If you, don't, if you forget to return the movie in two days, the third day, they will charge you late fees. Fourth day, a higher late fees. Fifth day, and so on. And if it is a new movie, it is a higher amount. This was 25% of their revenue, pure revenue. So when they said that we will send reminders to the user that you haven't returned your movie, they laughed. If you want to reduce our revenues, late fee is the best form of revenue. Yes, it was. No doubts about it. But who? Who were you pinching while getting that revenue? your user. So when they got an option where there was no late fee, what did they do? And the switch was like this, guys. We're not talking about a company which is 20 years old. We're talking about a company which was 15 years old. $5 billion of hard-earned cash valuation bankruptcy. Technology, same business model. 15 billion dollars. That's a lot of money, right? So, another example is BDCs. Each one of us, you know, have some, some use of foreign exchange. Everyone requires dollars and we know what the situation of dollars is, right? Yes or no? Yes. It's, it's, a, it's a very, very painful scenario, right? Here is a company from London called Transferwise. They said these bankers, my brother here is a banker, right? Ex-banker. These bankers, they make shitload of money. For what? Because I give them pounds and I want Naira from them. As high as 6% of the money goes to the two banks who transfer the money for me. So these guys started a small group. Oh, you live in London and you need Nairas. There is somebody else who comes to London very often to meet his kids who are studying there, needs pounds. They made a group of people and for three months they, read, uh, they ran an exercise where internally they exchanged funds without going to a bank. And that's when they started TransferWise. Everyone was shocked. Ah, what will happen to the banks? What will happen to the banks? But the banks were busy making money. 6%, yeah, they will pay. If they have to travel abroad, they will pay. Or they have to pay. 
they are rich, they have the money. And people have started moving to TransferWise. So all those who haven't tried TransferWise, give it a shot. I, I don't have shares there, I have no investment there. I'm just telling you because it's an experience to have. For your kids who are abroad, tell them about it. It charges you an insignificant amount compared to what the bank charges you for exchange. And it's a trustworthy form of transfer. So if somebody from London is going to India and needs rupees, and somebody from India is going to London, needs pounds, they just connect these two guys. It's a complex mechanism. They had to invest a lot of money. They've invested close to $60 million to reach a global scale. And they're only in, 20, I think, 16 or 20 countries. I don't remember. But I'm saying this is a three, four-year-old company. Maybe five, some, somewhere there. But they're doing already a billion dollars of transaction. That's big, right? Just small pain point. The transfer fee is very high. So please, don't forget. I mean, by, at the end of the presentation, I'm still going to repeat this, but I want to emphasize 10 minutes more. I'm going to emphasize that you need to help me for yourself, not share with me the pain points of your customer experience. Let's go ahead. So what has technology done is the big versus the fast. We've all heard about elephant being the big. We've all about, heard about, oh, that's a shoe. But I was going to talk about a tiger or a leopard, right? So we've all about heard about speed is very, very important. And in today's world, when things are changing fast, you have to try and make your business more flexible and fast. This will really help you give the speed that is required to transform your business. Now, in the next five, seven minutes, I'll give you a picture of what we are trying to do. We started this business five years back. I met with an accident in, on Ibadan Expressway. A lot of people came, me and my uh, friend. Uh, I used to work with a company called Indomi. A lot of people came to help us out. But you know what they helped? Ah, uh, how did it happen? I've just met an accident, right? How it happened is none of, it's not going to help anyone. Neither the guy who, who was on the other side nor me. What we need is, can you tell us where the nearest hospital is? What we need is, can you tell us where blood bank is? I think um, my, uh, the friend who was there in the car, his blood group was uh, negative, which was difficult to find. So he said, can we get the blood? And he was bleeding. I was still OK. So we didn't. None of the people on that road told us where the nearest hospital was. And the best option we had was to come back and go to a hospital in Lagos. Why? Then I sat and I said, let me search. I searched for hospitals, blood banks, and restaurants. This is 2008. And you'll be surprised. I got everything in Lagos. I had hospitals in Lagos. I had blood banks in Lagos. But that Lagos was not in Nigeria. There's another place, Lagos, called, called Lagos in Portugal. <laughs> you know what's the population of that place? 30,000 people. And they have everything online. Almost 18 million people. If you don't have any business online, wow. So that's where I left my job and we started WeConnect. The objective of WeConnect was to connect buyers and sellers. You want to look for a business, here you go. In the last five years, we've gathered a little more than 1.2 million businesses. We have millions of users who come on our platform on a daily basis, uh, on a monthly basis, inquire about the information they need and go. But in the last five years, what I heard, what I understood is what a small business really wants. And I'm going to share that with you. And maybe most of your businesses will be big, but maybe you can share it with your colleagues, your friends. Three things which make, which may forms the essence of brand building for a small business. Point number one, highlight your unique selling preposition. It's not a me too strategy, guys. Highlight your unique. Every business is different from another. Be very clear, practice it. In one line, you should be able to highlight your unique selling preposition. Point number two. You should be, you should be different. Person should be able to build a reputation about you. So if I have 
20 car shops. I want to buy a Tukumbo Mercedes. I have 20 car shops I can go to. But nobody tells me that this one is a trusted car. You know what will happen? My, delay, my decision to purchase will be delayed. I might end up, even after having 20 car shops near my house, I might end up importing my car from US on my own. Waste, right? I'm not a car importer. But because I don't know which is a trusted vendor, try and build your reputation. The second point for me is try and build your reputation. Your reputation is key. Your USP, your reputation, and the third and another important factor is listen to your customers. Even though you are the CEO, sorry, even though, even though you are the CEO, MD, chairman, double chairman, I don't care. I'm saying listen to your customer. Take their feedback and do it yourself. Because what will happen is, the person who took the feedback, you know, we are all good people. The person who takes the feedback, he will try and correct it before he brings it to you. Because he, he feels his job is that stick. He doesn't know it's a little bigger than his job alone. Try and meet and speak to your customer. The sort of satisfaction and the suggestions and the ideas that you will get, nobody will be able to. Try and speak to them. Try and make them feel privileged. Conversation with your customer will really help you in numerous ways. These three things can actually make a big difference between what a business is or people who are not doing this and people who start doing this. For a small business, this is my formula of brand building. This is VKNX formula of brand building and we work specifically on that. I know I'm running out of time. I have one slide to go, so I'll do that, right? Um, so entrepreneurs anywhere in the world, even Africa, can solve a global problem. I mean, everywhere in the world we are humans, right? We've traveled every part and we have seen their purchase decision, their needs are very similar to ours in a lot of perspectives. Maybe you, if you study the laundry segment, if you study the cake segment, maybe it has not been explored as well as what you can do anywhere in the world. And you can actually evolve, emerge as a global player. Uh, this is another example of a Kenyan company being used worldwide. Uh, so whenever there is a problem, People come up on this side, it's called Ushahidi. Ushahidi, try it. It has, I mean, on various uh, occasions, it was used worldwide. We've heard about M-Pesa, how well it has done in Kenya. But do you, do you know M-Pesa is in eight countries? It's in Afghanistan, South Africa, India, Romania, Albania, uh, Albania uh, and so on. This is an African, con African company. They can do it, we can do it. Technology has leveled the playing ground. So for you to think that business is small, they can't compete with me, you are fooling yourself. And for you to think another business in America is big and we can't compete with them, you're still fooling yourself. It's a level playing ground. Every one of us has the access to reach to the customer in the same way. So the last request I have is please, in your free time, think about your business, take out the pain points of your customers, and just go through the three steps of brand building. Are we doing what the basic steps of brand building? I know, I know advertising is important. I know marketing is important. Nobody is saying no for it. I'm not saying those don't work. But I'm saying before you start advertising, the three steps of branding, three steps of brand building, one was, I mean, anyone who wants to repeat it for good of everyone? How about your unique selling proposition? Unique selling proposition. Yeah. It's different. Give proposition. Build your, Build your reputation. Listen to your customers. Listen to your customers. I think these things, if you're doing, then you can go on CNBC, advertise yourself. You can go on BBC, promote yourself. You can go on any platform and market yourself. Thanks a lot. Really happy to spend time with you. Various other companies, like House of Tara, it has expanded into West Africa very well, and I think it's growing well. Uh, so these are great brands.
So I will include them. And I also they use technology in a very interesting manner. Uh, when we started five years back, the biggest problem was if we knocked on a business door. So we first we went to the government of Nigeria. We asked them, can we get some information? They said, yes, we have those folders there. You can get whatever you want. We looked at that data and we said, wow, let's go back. Then we went to our directory brothers. And we said, can we get some information so we can you know, highlight those businesses online? And less than 1% of the businesses had mobile numbers. Everyone had a Nitel or a, you know, almost that technology which was there when I was born. Right? And I said, who uses Nitel again? What percent? One percentage of the numbers were GSM, rest all were Nitel. I think the scenario is just the other way around. 99, or in my opinion, I've not called a non-GSM or non-CADMA number for ages. Anyone has? Right? So where, where will we get this information? So we said, OK, let's go to the field, get this information. And that was very challenging. We went to the field. My person, my data gathering officer, went to the company. He was beaten up. Because they said, what are you going to do? Why are you taking our picture? What are you going to do with this information? Are you going to send robbers to our place? So people had appreciation, apprehensions. But things have changed. So this is a very simple answer, right? So we invested. He asked me the previous question, which was how difficult it was for creating that database. And that database is our business backbone. Yes or no? So we've invested a couple of million dollars in building that up. So we don't sell data. We don't sell data. We provide you API. So if you want to start a restaurant portal tomorrow, or you want to start a handicraft portal tomorrow, I will give you the data in the form of API to start that portal. But we don't sell data. Hey, bring your, Excel, bring your flash drive, connect it to my computer. I will put all the data and give you. We don't do that. But we can help a business market to all these businesses. So if it's an inter-switch, which is a B2B service, right? A B2C as well as B2B, yeah. Wants to reach out, fair enough. If it's if a cake, if it's a cake business, wants to reach out because she she mentioned she sells equipments for cake sellers as well, right? So that's a great model. If she wants to reach out to cake sellers, we have cake shops registered. You can go, if you want to try it, you can go and see five, seven, ten cake shops. But if you want to send it to a thousand cake shops, you'll have to reach us. Make it into a system so you can get feedback. Somebody writes a review on your company on the portal. You'll get a notification on your phone. Hi, somebody has reviewed you, and you get to see it. You get to reply back to that review. Sorry, if your experience was bad, I'll try and work on it. Thanks for your inputs. And you know, it really make, makes a lot of difference. Everyone has used TripAdvisor? TripAdvisor? Yeah. It's a great service for those who haven't. Please do. Whenever you're making a decision on which hotel to stay in, it will really help you. TripAdvisor. What they do is they connect users to hotels. And you can talk. You can read millions of people's reviews and ratings. So somebody wants to go with a pet. Somebody wants to go to a room which has soft bed. Somebody, people have different expectations and requirements. They're all unique. And what you need to have there is TripAdvisor has enabled businesses, hotels, to get feedback from customers and get inquiries from customers. And some, that's something. But they do specifically for hotels. We do generic for small and medium scale businesses in Nigeria. Thank you. Lagos Business School, Pan-Atlantic University.